Good morning, Love Life. Are we ready for the word this morning? I know I am. How many of you ever came to church with an attitude and not a good one? And what you got to do is shake it off. Amen. Shake it off. Man, you guys got great lives. Only three of us have trouble. I had trouble coming to church this morning. I don't know, but you know, I had some issues. No, I didn't. I have had issues though. I've had a lot of weird things happen on Sunday mornings, but not today. So I'm up. But guess what? Even if something did happen, I would not change. I'd make the choice to rejoice. Amen. So that's what we always need to remember. The reason why I'm saying that is it lines up with what I'm about to uh, talk about this morning, and that is uh, the opportunity opportunity um, to be able to put to action what we're believing. You know, a lot of times we uh, have the tendency not to do what we're being taught. And so we live the way we've always lived and we act the way we've always acted. But until we get those times of attacks or pressures or whatever we're going through, and we all go through them, that's when we find out who we really are in here. Is it working? Is it working? I remember, I'll never forget this, the first day that I did something that would always, 100% always bring a cuss word. Always. I'm talking about the way I lived my life before Jesus. And what I did was, is I opened the door to my car. I was, I was going to church, opened the door to my car, and I had, I forgot what it was in my hands, but it dropped, I grabbed it, and I went like this and banged my knee right up against the door. Any other day, I would have let out all kinds of words. And not, a cuss word didn't come out. And I, I, I almost threw a party right there. I, that was the day where I realized, you know what? I'm, I'm, something's happening in here. It wasn't, you know, an F-bomb. It was, it was nothing of what used to come out came out. And it made me, I was like, oh my gosh, I was so happy. And I've been happy all week since. No, I mean, that, that was years ago. That was years and years ago. That was before I was doing anything in ministry. Um, but the point is, and not that I haven't thought about it, um, you know, in my life as a Christian, but it was, it's pretty interesting when, uh, you see something happen that isn't the way you used to be. And that just, it gives you a little building, a little time where you're going, all right, all right. Now there are many times, and I'm not going to lie. There are many times that I've done things that I've always done and, and almost want to throw in the towel. And that's because I didn't know what the scripture teaches. I didn't know the Bible. I just knew, you know, the, the religiosity or the Christianese. So, you know, you deal with issues, you know, the way you always dealt with them and, and you're not having victory in the places where you believe you should be. And, and those become something where you feel like, you know, am I saved? You know, am I really, you know, following Jesus? And we start questioning. I need you to understand something that that's not anything that God has ever wanted you to do. Never. He's never wanted you to question what has been done to you. What he wants you to do, he wants you to grow. But he's never, ever, ever, in his word, ever wanting us to question, are we saved or are we loved or are we, you know, whatever. Never. It's not in his word. But we do this. And the enemy is the world, the, the past, our past, the enemy, he wants us to question. He wants us to have doubt. Because when we have questions or doubt, we're on the weakest position in life. You're not on a strong position. It's when you know, when you know something where you're secure. I'm not talking about Christianity, I'm talking about life. 
When you know something, you're secure. You feel secure. You, you walk secure. You live secure because this is what you know. You know this and you got this. It's when you don't. It's when you're questioning. It's when you're doubting. You're not secure anymore. There's something wrong. And what I want to do is I want to look at the, what, what I have here is how to fire up your life. And I know you've heard the term fire up, how to fire up, how to get your life pumped up, energized, how to get your life where you're not just dragging around or living. And I'm not saying Christian life. I'm saying life because this is what this talks about. It's not talking about Christian life. Nothing in the Bible is is leaning toward the emphasis of a religious life. It's leaning away from all that religion to life, period. Life, period. You want to know what the, the, the being a follower of Jesus is about? I'll show you right now. It's simple. Watch. I'm breathing. That's what being a follower of Jesus is. I've received him and now I breathe. I'm living life. And that's what defines me. Not reading a Bible, not having a Bible, not going to church. What defines me is I received him and now I live. He lives in me. We are one together. That's my life. Now, I have a process of life to grow in life, right? When you're born on this earth, your parents don't go, I hope you turn out good and walk away. Do they? No, there is a process of the, the growing and maturing. Everybody say maturing. All right, so that takes what? It takes instruction. It takes hearing and doing, right? Hearing and doing. I'm sure not all of you made straight A's all the way through elementary, junior high, and high school, and maybe college. You never, you, you just got A's on every test. I don't believe there's probably anyone in here that has done that. Right? And you guys just leave me hanging out here. What's up? Come on now. We need to understand that there are times when, you know, we're, we're not going to have the answer. We're not going to have the information. But we don't stop. We grow. We continue to learn. We, didn't, we, haven't, we don't learn, you know, arithmetic in one day in first grade, and we have it. We don't learn how to read or write the first day, and we have it. It's a process, right? Well, it's the same way in this faith. It's a process of growing. But it doesn't mean you're not a learner. It means that you're growing and maturing. You have to choose not to learn. You have to choose not to listen. That's, that's going to be you. And when we start realizing about the importance of our choices, we're not going to be able to do anything. Everything in life's tied to your choice. Everything in this faith is tied to your choice. So we either going to make a good one or a bad one. But I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to make a choice. You're going to make a choice. So we need to realize this and, and get to the place where we're going, okay, I'm going to be able to wipe, wipe this stuff off and move on and make the choice of I'm going to have a good day. It can't, listen, I can't say I'm going to have a good day, have a messed up problem, which happens many times where something's not happening right, but I said I'm going to have a good day, and now it's not a good day. What do I do? Do I just scratch off what I just said? Do I now say, okay, might as well quit. It's ruined day now. My life sucks forever. No, I don't do that. I've got to get through this. I've got to get by this. I've got to get around this. I've got to do whatever I need to do to get to the place where I'm going, you know what? It's a good day either way. No matter what I'm dealing with, it's a good day. Why? Because it's not defined by my feelings, it's defined by my choice. And that's what life's about. That's what life's about. Psalms 103.1, I'm going to show you something. Um, David, King David is, is a, a king in the scripture, the Old Testament, that, I mean, w was the greatest in Israel. And, it's, and he's a king that, represented the heart of God in a, in a big way. Because God said, I'm looking after someone to be a king that has my heart. And that was David. 
And we look at the life of David and we don't see perfection, but that's not saying that's what God is. It's his attitude. Everybody say attitude. Okay, so attitude's tied to a choice, right? So you can make right choices, good attitude, or bad choices, bad attitude. But it has to do with the attitude. Jesus would make this comment many times. He'd say, do you have ears to hear? Well, I mean, everybody would go, duh, look, you can't see my ears. I'm hearing, see? But we understand that that's not what he was saying. And when he said it, they understood. He wasn't asking, y'all got ears? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? He wasn't doing that. He was making a statement to them about their attitude. And he says, do you have an attitude to hear what I'm about to say? In the Greek language, it's literally a position hearing with the purpose of obeying. Obedience or obeying, you know, it's almost like a derogatory thing, but it's a necessary thing for success. We just, we just don't want to use that term because we don't want no one to ever think that we didn't know it all. You know what I'm saying? So we got to get to the place where we're obedient to listening. What does that mean? It means I'm going to hear without fighting it. Could you imagine going to kindergarten, first grade, and you sit there and the teacher goes, one puppy, two puppy. No, it isn't. How far are you going? You ain't going far at all, are you? No, not at all. And when I went to school, they would have gave me a paddle if I did that. Some of you need some paddles going on. A lot of you do. But the point is, is we want to grow and learn. So we're going to look at David and I want you to see something. Let's look at scripture correctly, not religiously, correctly, just the way it is. It's written for us to read it correctly, not religiously. All right. David's word, him writing about him right now. David writes Bless the Lord, O my soul. This is what David's writing. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What is he saying? He's speaking to the soul is your your mind, your emotional area of life. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. You're a three-part being. You're a three-part being. You have a spirit. You're a spirit. You have the soul, the emotional area, what we deal with people on earth. We don't deal with people in the spirit. We want to be spirit controlled to the soul part, but our spirit isn't controlling us in it's now acting. Do you understand that? It's your soul. That's what we deal with one another. So I'm not spiritually dealing with you. I might be communicating spiritual things, but it's all translated through my soul, the emotional area of my life. That's why I can go, ah, and uh, emotion, all right? So in that, I want you to understand that as David is writing, he's making a command to himself. He's commanding himself, bless the Lord, Attitude, bless the Lord, soul, bless the Lord, make the choice right now, you're going to do this. He's talking to himself. And then he says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. In the Hebrew, he's using an emphasizing attitude. He's commanding the whole time, and in how he's writing, He's literally saying, bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And the reason why it's so important to understand this is because he's writing this in a really whacked up time of his life where he could throw a fit, where he could be dragging his feet, where he could be complaining and whining in my life and, and, and the whole nation of Israel is trying to kill me and no one loves me and, and, and God said you're going to be king and here I'm running for my life and oh my gosh, it's miserable. Why'd you choose me? He could have went that way. And you know what? He probably was. And he got to the place where he said, stop it. 
See, this is what we don't want to read. We want to read that. No, David's, David didn't do that. He, he's, just, he's just so perfect. No, he's not. Why would he have to command himself if he's doing it right? We don't even need to hear this. But he wasn't doing it right. He was hurt. He was broken. He was mad. He was angry. He was doing all the things that we do. But he stopped himself and said, bless the Lord. I'm not talking just to this area. I'm saying all of you, get together. Wipe it off. Let's move forward. Bless him. And I guarantee you, after he wrote that, he started going, bless you, God. Bless you. Oh, God, you're so good. I guarantee it. Then he moves on and says this, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You see, it's, it's so good to go, oh, bless you, God. But you know what? God's, God isn't up in heaven going, oh, I just need you to say that over and over because, you know, I have rough days too. Parents can understand this. When your child does the right thing. And in doing the right thing, you see them in a way where you're so proud because they heard, they obeyed, and now they're doing it. And you're going, that's it. Because you know that's the pattern of success. That's the pattern. And so you can have a kid go, oh, you know, I love you and it's so good. And you can have a kid, you know, just because of the relationship of the parent where you just, hmm. But when they do something through the process of obedience, it brings something within a, a, a father and mother's heart where you're going, it's, it's working. This thing is working. This is good. It's, this is special. I gotta emphasize to my son, right? <laughs> Hearing and doing is awesome. <laughs> I got good boys. The point is, is this. David is, is showing us something. And I want you to see it. I want you to have ears to hear. I want you to hear him. I want you to recognize what's going on in his life. Like I said, it's not a good thing right now. He's, he's, ran, he's running from the nation, a whole nation. Could you imagine if the United States, you know, one day, you know, you read on Fox News. Oh, by the way, the whole nation's after Daniel McCluskey. I'm telling you, everybody, the whole armed services is after me. That's, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? And that's what's happening to David. And what he does, he runs to, he can't run to Israel, so he has to go to his enemy's city. And now he's in the Philistine city, the enemy of Israel. And he's trying to hang with them. Can, can, are you guys looking at this? This is like crazy guy. Now he's in a position where he's now with his enemies, and the enemy's like going, is that David? I mean, literally, they're going. So the whole picture is this a messed up life. Messed up. But he comes to the place where he realizes, you know what? i got to fix this. Just like we need to. We need to fix things. A lot of us don't want to because we want to drag it on. We want people to pay. We want people to feel our pain. And we do opposite of what the word of God is trying to show us, an example of success for our lives. He says, I'm not going to forget your benefits. And then he says this, he forgives all iniquities. He heals all diseases. He redeems my life from destruction. He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies my mouth with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. And he's just popping away, man. And this life is what? It's going up and up and up. Every single time he says, my God is a good God. My God loves me. My God's just for me. He's not against me. My God looks at me and says, we are on track together. And I talk that way all the time because I need to. I need to. And I continue to speak these things out. Now I may be thinking, well, well has Pastor Lau heard you? Has your sons heard you? No. 
This is between me and my father. I'm talking to my God. This ain't for show and tell. This is I'm telling me. I'm commanding me. I'm telling me. Line up. Straighten up. Get your life going right. I talk to myself way more than I should probably. Sometimes I get down to some, you know, I, yeah, that was dumb. I got to watch myself. Because there are times when you're trying to get yourself straightened out and you get negative. And I don't want you going negative. Negative talk is not God talk. Negative talk is not the way the word of God wants you to talk. No. Yeah, but it's true. In whose eyes? In whose eyes? See, I believe this. I believe you can do dumb through whatever it is you're doing, but you can't define yourself as dumb. You can do dumb. So, Anybody have any toddlers right now? You got a toddler? You ever seen a toddler do everything perfect? Don't they do dumb? No, I mean, but no, 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 no. Define it correctly. Don't they do dumb? Yeah, but what do we say? It ain't dumb. Why? They're just toddlers. They're just babies. Anybody hear that before? They're just babies. What are you doing? You're excusing dumb. The cereal goes in the mouth, not on the floor. I, I've seen them. I've seen, I've, seen, I've seen it on TV. And I know Google backs me up on this too. But I mean, isn't it true though? They, do, they can do some weird stuff. Daniel, my, my oldest, there wouldn't be a drop of food going to the floor. That dude was, I mean, when it was food time, it's all going here. He gets so stressed out that if he heard the jar smack the side like it was empty, it could be three quarters full. He'd start going, ah, ah. is that crazy? That's Daniel. Now they might be thinking, no, dad, don't. My kids don't care. They're like going, that's not who I am now. That's why I was. This is what I am now. Yeah, he's still that way with food. <laughs> it's just a, teens, man. <laughs> he says, I don't forget his benefits. So what does he do? What do we should be doing? Start talking his benefits. Start talking about his goodness. Start talking about the things you know that the word of God, and you might be going, well, I don't know. Then you need to know. You need to come listen more. Pay attention. Listen to YouTube. Of love life, not of other stuff. Second Peter 1 6 says, Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. What I just now read is something that the Apostle Paul wrote his spiritual son, Timothy. Timothy, in 2 Timothy, is being told something about his spiritual dad. Now, Timothy relies on the Apostle Paul because that's the person that has, that has influenced and impacted him and now is, you know, the pastoring his soul and being this position of imparting into his life as Paul did many, many people in scripture. And so second Timothy, meaning that first Timothy was written, it's written about all different things other than what Timothy's dealing with now. What has happened is a few years have passed since first Timothy and we're now in the second Timothy where Nero is now running the country. And y'all heard about the story of Nero, you know, Nero burning Rome. Well, that is historical fact. The problem is, is in that historical fact of this crazy Nero, psycho Nero, he blamed the burning of Rome on Christians. Again, historical fact. Now, this, now we're not talking about Bible, so we're talking about stuff that's written in history. We've, it's been dug up, found. And what he did is he used Christians as an excuse for what he did. He burned Rome down because the Senate in Rome 
did not approve what he wanted to do in Rome. He wanted to bulldoze Rome. They didn't have bulldozers. He wanted to knock down Rome and build his own special palace and his own special home, a massive, massive structure with a massive statue. And they said, no, Rome's, Rome's ancient. You can't do that. And he got mad and burned it down himself. And they called him in. And they're sitting there going, this is, this is bad. This, you can't do this. And so Nero blamed the Christians. He says, the Christians did it. They're, they're the ones. They're the ones. That, and because of what they're being taught, they're, taught, they're being taught of, of fire and all this stuff. And so they're just blaming everything on the Christians. It's a whole story of what took place to put this all on Christians. The problem now is, is Timothy's church is freaking out. Because now there's persecution in, a, in the highest level against the Christian faith. Before, it was we can get along. They ain't nobody. Now, the persecution from the nation is coming against the Christian faith. And now they're in a place where now they're getting fed to lions. They're being burned on crosses. This is all going on now because they're now saying Jesus is Lord. That's who we serve. Timothy's losing church members. His leadership are quitting. People that said, Timothy, in 1 Timothy, we got your back, brother. You're our pastor. We'll go through everything with you. And all of a sudden, a little pressure, pressure starts coming in. They're like going, I'm out of the ministry now. See ya. And they're running. Timothy is in this church going, oh, Paul, Paul. Papa, Papa, help me. And he, and he, and he gets, he gets a letter to Paul saying, this is what's happening. I'm scared. I can't do this. This is, I, I, I don't even know if I can continue following you. And I, and he's going through this whole process of, of communicating to the apostle Paul. And the apostle Paul writes back and says, Timothy, Listen, you got to get your act together. You're looking at the wrong things. You're focused in on everything that you ought not to be looking at. You got to get back to what you should be seeing, what you should be hearing, what you should be saying. This is what you're called to do, Timothy. You've got this gift within you. You've been trained by your grandma and your mama. They've been teaching you. You grew up with believing in Jesus. And now here you are, you following me. I've been parted in your life. I've given you truth. I've taught you stuff that, that will be able to shepherd your flock to be able to mature and train your followers, your, your people in your church. Timothy, and this is where he says this. He says this. I remind you, stir up the gift of God, which is in you. That is not at all bringing a position of gift of God is this special gift that only Timothy has. The gift of God, everybody has. God gives gifts to all. You all have gifts. We make this into something that says, well, the pastor or this, that's the gift. No, y'all been given a gift. Every one of you, everybody in here gifts. All of you. That's why we need you to mature and to start helping. Because we need your gifting. I mean, there are some awesome people that are gifted in our children's ministry. I'm not gifted for it. I'm not gifted for nursery. I'm not gifted for toddlers. I'm not gifted for children. <laughs> Except my own. I'm not. I, I had a hard time with diapers my, with my own kids. Man, I was, if it's diaper time, I'm looking around going, someone take care of this because they don't smell right right now. I had to literally put my shirt above my nose and I mean, it just like, <laughs> yeah, I was that dad. What of it? I'm shaking that off. But I did do it when I had to. I wasn't like going to leave them in their poop. So anyway, so I did change diapers. So don't look at me that way. Y'all looking all negative right now. 
Some of you don't even have kids. How dare you? All right. You're just talking trash right now. You don't know yet. But the point is, is, is what is the point? I don't even have a clue now. What was I saying? Oh, wait. Right. So everybody, no, no one has gifts, just me. <laughs> no. 1 Peter 4, 11 says this. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, they got grace to handle those kids. When I got into the area of it, it, my, my speciality at one point was the teens and college age. I did this for years for teens and college. That's all I thought I'd ever do for the rest of my life, work with teens and college. I loved it. I was, I was impacting. I was influential. I, I, I taught all over the world on youth ministry and college age ministry. I was, I was speaker at many, many, many conferences where thousands of people would come. I was doing all that. And people, you know, enjoyed to hear what the information I had. I loved youth ministry. I loved it. I loved doing that. I loved it so much that when God said, it's time to be a pastor, I said, no, it ain't. I literally told God, no, you're, you're missing it. God. <laughs> yeah, God, you're missing it. And I, and I fought and struggled because I didn't want to do that. I didn't. Being a youth pastor, you already see what the pastor goes through. And you're like going, heck no, I don't want to do that. Man, he gives us life and people stab him in the back left and right. They love the youth pastor. I, they never stabbed me in the back. I was just a youth pastor. I mean, I, I got all the outs. Everybody, I'm serious. Everybody would love me. Everybody. But see, I wasn't pastoring them. I wasn't going to them going, hey, that's not a really good way to live. I wasn't doing that. I was just working with their kids. It was awesome. Missions trips. I mean, we did everything. We, you know, go to, you know, Magic Mountain and, oh, yeah, this is cool. But, man, the pastor, what a life. I go, I would never want to be that person. Never. It's a terrible place to be. It's like God's going, oh, there's a reason. There is a reason. Oh, you want to keep being negative? You're going to do it. Yes, you're going to do it. Oh, we're going to have fun with this. Look at this. You are going, oh, you don't, you say you'll never. Woo-hoo. You want to say some more nevers? Well, come on. Come on, say it. Say never again. Now, he didn't talk that way, but I think that way sometimes. The point is, is, is the giftings of God are there in everybody. And what I'm trying to say is, is this, is there are times when the gift or what God has placed in you to impact life, whatever it is, impact life in nursery, impact life in kids, impact life in cleaning churches, impact life in giving, impact life in administrating, impact life of teaching, impact life of of, of it, greeting people coming in, you're all impacting life. The moment you are in front of someone, there's an impact happening. There's an impact happening. And so this thing that's happening in Timothy is, is he, Paul used the term stir up. And in the Greek, it's, it's, it's what you would imagine in the sense of it's taking embers in a fire and you've got wood there, but you've got to stir that thing up to get the embers going and get them hotter. So you're stirring it, moving it around because air needs to get in there to start it on flame, to get the flames going again. And, and it's something that you have to have the right attitude to do that. You can't just poke around and go, okay, that's good enough. There's an intensity to what you're doing because you're trying to get the fire going. There's a purpose for it, either cooking, keeping warm, marshmallows, whatever, all right? So they're, they're poking, 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 and the fire's going. And that's what Paul uses in the Greek. He's saying, listen, Timothy, you, you feeling cold and you're feeling lukewarm now because you're not stirring yourself up. Listen to me, followers of Jesus. The majority of, quote, Christians love poking fingers and saying, that's the reason why. 
That's the reason. It's because this, they didn't sing my favorite song. The temperature was too cold. It was too hot. And all these outward reasons why I'm not turned on for Jesus anymore. There's just no more anointing in this house. That's weird. But that's what religion does. It never wants to say, Maybe it's because I just don't spend time with the Lord and I don't even think about his word and I really don't even think about him at all. I just live my life. And, but we don't want to do that because then we don't look spiritual and we can't use the Holy Spirit now because I'm being real with myself. Paul says, Timothy, stir it up, bud. Stir it up. Quit whining. Throw some dirt on it. I remember when I first heard that in baseball, I slid into third. Man, it hurt. And I, and I, I didn't twist my ankle, but man, it felt bad. And I got up and I went, ah, like that. And that coach goes, throw some dirt on it, McCluskey. It hurts. That's the first time I heard, throw some dirt on it. I thought, what is it, magical dirt? Heal it? Anybody ever hear that? Throw some dirt on it. All right, we got some athletes in there. All right, anyway. So it says here, he says, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. For God has not given you. What? For, for, God, has not give, for God has not given. Stir up the gift. For God has not given. Stir up the gift that has been given to you. This God our God has placed a gift. Once you receive Jesus, you have a gift in you. For God has not given. You have a gift, but God has not given this one. And this one is, is what? A spirit of fear. Now people are going, well, what's the difference? I mean, fear or spirit of fear? Spirit of fear is a spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Now, I'm not saying there's like a spooky spirit of fear, woo, jumping on you, but it's the spiritual process or action that takes place in fear. It's not like anything else. All you have to do is look at statistics, scientific, medical, psychological. Fear brings death and destruction, 100%. There's nothing where you can find any type of record showing that fear is good for you. Nowhere. It breaks your body. It breaks your mind. Everything. It, it brings destruction. So this fear, Paul's talking to Timothy saying, that didn't come from God. Why would he say that? Because see, Timothy's the pastor. He's the leader. He's the one that's leading his people. And God, I mean, Paul's saying, God, you need, I mean, Paul's saying, Timothy, you need to understand something. This thing don't come from God. And if it doesn't come from God, you got to get it off you. You got to get this thing off you. And so he says, for God has not given you a spirit of fear, but now please all of you, uh, you know, I, I see we have a lot of people that you're new here. This might be your first time. Welcome. But I need you to see something correctly. We don't look at Scripture, the Bible, religiously. We look at it correctly. That means I'm going to pay attention to what's being said in here. So Paul tells Timothy, listen, God doesn't give you that, so it's not, it doesn't belong to you. But, and now this is what he says, but what he does give to you, so now he's going to a place where, listen, he goes, all right, for me, I read, Daniel, read this. Okay, uh, you might be feeling a little down, and, and things are getting rough, and ministry, and, and that church is really giving you headaches sometimes, and you're, 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 pressured here and you're having this issue and you can get to a place where you're like going, oh gosh. And then what do I do? I look at the word and it says, Daniel, stir it up, stir it up. Now, when it's speaking in the Greek language, it's telling you to do something, but the analogy and the emphasis is on how do you stir it up? Do I
Is that how I stir it up? Because physically, I'm saying, I got to physically stir it up. How do you stir it up? Well, when you're looking at how it's written and the communication of the letter, it's saying that the ability or the poker is what you say to yourself. It's the communication to yourself. And so he says this, stir yourself up. I remind you, I laid hands on you. You received this gift. So Timothy goes, this is him stirring up. I remember Paul laid his hands on me. I received this gift. I received the gift when God, God, God came into my life. I have this gift operating in me. I am in a position of a pastor. I have the largest Christian church right now. He's got the largest church going. And so he starts stirring it up. Okay, okay. Yeah, now he's remembering. Now he's going, okay, we got this. It's been working. It's been working. Now we're going through some tough times. Things are happening. Things aren't normal. Things are getting a little more difficult, but that doesn't change God. So he's starting to stir it up, stir it up. And then Paul says, but listen, Timothy, that spirit of fear didn't come from God. But let me tell you what comes from God. And then he says this, what comes from God, Timothy, is power. He goes into power. First thing he says, power, the word dunamis. Dunamis is the supernatural, explosive power that is in every believer. You have this power within you. Oh, by the way, you know dunamis in the Greek, when it's written, it's also in connection to earthquakes. The power of an earthquake. The power of a hurricane. Woo! That's power, right? Isn't that power? It brings destruction. It'll tear things apart. It'll, it, 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 it's power. And the Greek uses that word dunamis. Guess what else it's used? When the full army, in, in other words, Paul is writing to Timothy in Rome. And so he looks at the full force of the army of the Roman army, the full force of it. That's dunamis as well. So what Paul's saying is, is this power the explosive power, the ability to, to break things up, to move things, to shake things, the power of a Roman army coming. That's in you, boy. That's in you. Timothy's reading this. He isn't reading it like, well, you know, I got to get my daily Bible reading in. I got to read my chapter today. That's religion, people. It's all it is. It won't do anything for you. I'm telling you right now, you can read the Bible through the whole year. It ain't going to do anything for you other than you can say, I read the Bible through the whole year. That's all it's going to do. Now, if some scripture that you're reading and you stop and it starts, you start coming alive within you and you're going, oh my gosh, this is in there. I didn't even see this before. And it starts ministering your heart and you're thinking, oh man, I just read this and I'm, oh gosh, I need to be doing. That's when it's impacting. But just reading it ain't going to do anything. Not at all. So what happens here is Timothy's getting this. Then he says this, love, agape. One of the hardest, if not the hardest, grace is another word that's very difficult to explain in English. We don't have a full ability to explain it. If it was phileo, Oh, we know, it, we know that like the back of our hand, phileo. Because that's the way majority of everybody on planet Earth operates in love. Agape, that's where we all want to. We want that. Usually we want it in the other person working it toward us. No, really, I'm just being real. See, agape is that love that there's no strings attached as a matter of fact, agape is, is I'm going to do this. I don't care if you do it or not. I don't even care if you receive it. I'm going to do it anyway. Woo. That's when everybody's like in stars. You know, they, before they say I do, they think, and it's all about agape. And then they get married and agape is like, where'd it go? <laughs> what, what do you mean uh, dinner has to be? What do you mean this has to be? What do you, I didn't do this. You got to do this. You didn't do this. Y'all going to get this. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally... That's what phileo love is. It's all about, <laughs> what are you doing for me? 
You want me to do it, but what are you doing for me? Agape is like going, I'm going to change because it's the right to change. Period. It's the right thing to do. Phileo is, I'll change if you change. Start. Ready, go. And we don't really want to talk about agape a lot because, man, does that, it hurts. It shows us how little we really truly love. But guess what? God says, I gave it to you. Oh, what? Do you know that that love and the ability to love in that way is inside of you? Already there. The love of God has been placed in your hearts already. Well, then why isn't it working? Because everything that is given to you through the word of God is operated through knowledge of what belongs to you. And if you never know it belongs to you, you don't get to walk in it because you don't know. But when you start looking at what the word of God says and you start seeing it and going, wait a minute, it's in there. So I don't have to be selfish. I don't have to be selfish. I can be better. See, now I'm making change. I'm making, I'm giving me information that says, you know what? No, I can love. I can love better than I'm loving right now. I guarantee you, you can make that comment forever. Forever. Don't ever quit. I don't care how long you've been married. Pastor Lau and I, in October, will be married 25 years. 25 years. It's been a long, hard 25 years, I'll tell you right now. 25 years. Now, that 25 years, again, it's, it's not like we have arrived 25, we, that's it, we, we're sliding now. No, there's more work. More work. I have no problem with that. Why? Because I know what this life is about. That's what keeps me alive. That's what keeps me focused. That's what keeps me passionate about this thing. I'm not messing around. I'm growing and I'll continue to grow. Believe me, I know a ton. I know a whole lot and I should know a whole lot. I've been doing this a long time. But I've never arrived. And I'll never, ever say that I don't need any more information. Because every single day I learn something new. And this has never changed. That's an impossibility in a normal book. But this isn't a normal book. This is written in words of life. And that's why I can read things in here, and it'll impact me. I could, I could have read it over a thousand times, which 100% positive, it's been over a thousand times I've read this stuff. Over a thousand times, easily, easily. And I'll get something new and fresh all the time. This is why this is something we had to, we have to get involved in our lives to live life and to live at large, because this is what this will do to you. But we've got to go to war. We've got to fight for the right to receive this. It's just not, we just can't roll over and everything happens. We've got to be aggressive. We've got to be a, a, a person that recognizes the responsibility to keep growing, to keep learning, keep moving forward. And I promise you, you get that attitude. You get the tenacity of that relentlessness, relentlessness in your life. Woo, you're living life big now. It's an awesome, awesome journey. Amen. He says, God's given you power. He's given you love and a sound mind. Sound mind is, it's a compound, sonfronismas. And it, you break it down to two words, and it literally means saved mind. And what that saying is, is that God's given us an ability to have a discipline. It's there. The mind has the ability to think correctly. Sound mind is what's necessary to understand you have, because fear is not sound. Fear is crazy. 
Fear is emotional. Fear exaggerates. They're all after me. Everybody's after me. No, just that one little kid's chasing you. No, that's everybody. Fear is irrational. And when you start looking at fear correctly, you start realizing, yeah, it's, it's, it's all over the place. Fear is about future. Yeah, it's not even now, it's future. So you're scared of something that hasn't even happened. Fear. That spirit is now affecting your physically. It hasn't happened yet, but because the fear's in you, by choice, by choice, since the, I need you to, I'm going to say it again, by choice. Some of you, because of your life, you've defined yourself as a fearful person. That is a big, fat lie. You are not a fearful person. You've made more choices toward fear because you didn't know you had a choice. I want you free from that. You, you're, you've been under bondage way too long. I'm, I'm talking to a few of you right now. You are not a fearful person. Yeah, but everybody knows. No, 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 no. Everybody knows that you didn't know. They didn't know that you didn't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was Greek. Well, everybody operates by their training. You get someone with a different mindset, a different ideology, they can see you and go, no, no, that's not you. That's not you. That's what you need. You need a spiritual papa to say, that's not you. Pastor, I can never do that. Yeah, you can. Well, how can you say that? You don't even know me. I know my God. And my God said, you can do all things. So don't tell me what my God can't do through you. Because I know you can. I know you can. But see, you're still looking at your past. You're still looking at your old life. You're still looking at everything that says you're a loser, you're no good, you never amount to anything, blah, 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 blah. But my God comes in with the truth. He knows you. There's no one that knows you like him. No one. And I'd advise you to listen to him. Because he's going to tell you about the real you. And all of a sudden, those days where you always, most of the time you get up like, oh, life sucks. Pretty soon you're going to get up, man. You're going to have a hop. You're going to have a step. You're going to be walking like, what is up, world? And before you used to go, oh. I'm telling you, I, I promise you, I've seen this hundreds and hundreds of times in people's lives. So I'm not talking about someone that doesn't know. I've seen it. I've seen it. Y'all, you don't know how powerful you are. You've got power in you. You've got love in you. And you've got a sound mind. Look how special you guys are. Look how special you are. So we don't want the spirit of fear because that'll rob us. Amen. Timothy goes down in the letter and he says, hold fast. He says, hold fast the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me. Hold fast, grip tightly, don't let go. The words that you've heard from me, Tim, you've heard me talk about this. You heard me, I've, I've, I've ministered to you, I've showed you how this works, I've given you analogies, I've given you quote, quote parables. Timothy, you know, I've taught you, I've taught you. Look where you are now. You're a pastor of the largest church around. Come on, Timothy, come on, hold fast, grip hold, let, don't let go. What? The pattern of truth, the pattern of what I've taught you. This doesn't match the pattern, Timothy. Here's the pattern. And you're trying to put this inside that square. It ain't gonna work, Tim. That's what Paul's doing. Now we're looking at the Bible like we should look at it. Common sense. I'm looking at it as Paul's talking to me. Come on, Daniel. Come on. Let's do this. Quit looking at the wrong things. Quit allowing fear to, get, to, to warp the way you're viewing. Stop it. That's not the pattern. That's not the correct pattern. The correct pattern is you know them. I taught you. And he says, he said, hold fast to the pattern of the words which you heard from me. The what? The pattern of sound words that you heard from me. Sound words. Everybody say sound this Greek word is amazing. It, it, this is, it's, it's a compound. Hoogie, I know. Hoogie, I know. Hoogie, I know. Do you know him? 
No, it's hugiano. That's the word. And it literally means health, wellness. Health, wellness. And in the language and how it's being used, it's literally everything that processes, possesses, produces health, wellness, wholeness in life. That's what that word means. So he's saying this, you need to hold fast to the words that bring health and life and success to you and grip them, hold tight to them. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. That's what he's telling me right now. This is what he's telling you. Hold fast, don't let it go, don't release it. These healthy life words that produce healthy results. Where's he getting this? Theonustos, the Greek word of everything in the word is God breathe. God breathe. Paul's getting this life from God, the spirit of God's ministering to Paul as he writes these letters. Paul's heart is, Timothy, I want to help you. And he starts writing. And the Spirit of God starts ministering to him. And he starts writing these things down. He's not writing. He's, I don't know how he used to do it. Who knows? Anyway, I don't know how, what they were doing. Either way. Yeah, I was on a scroll, so it had to be some type of. Whatever. There wasn't a kinko, so let's move on. All right. Paul says, Listen to sound words which you heard from me. He said, what? Hold fast. Timothy, you need to grip hold of these words and don't let them go. You need to grab them tight. Get those words operating in your life and don't allow the enemy to rob you. Don't allow the circumstances. Don't allow the situation. You, you're dealing with things in your job. You're dealing things with the company. You're dealing things at a home. You're dealing things with school. There's issues. We're all going to be dealing with something. So what are you going to do? You're going to ravel, start getting fearful. You're going to ravel, start going back to your old ways. Or are you going to suck it up? You're going to get this position and go, wait a minute, I'm going to stir this thing up. Stir it up, stir it up, and start saying, you know what? You can do this. You can do this. You're born again. You, you got the life of God in you. You are a follower of Jesus. The Lord is your Savior. You're submitted to him. You believe in him. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He's strengthening me. And you start talking to yourself. You start bringing life, bringing life. I promise you, I swear to you, you start speaking this stuff, your body will 100% start being fired up, energized. I promise you it will. Guarantee it. You know why? I'm talking a spiritual truth and every spiritual truth has a natural principle. Anybody in here play, you know, a high level, say, let's go, you know, a senior, junior, a varsity level sport or higher. Anybody in here at all? A few of you? A few of you? Okay. All right, different analogy. <laughs> Anybody wish you did? <laughs> that, the reason why I, I, I'm trying to explain that is, is that is one of the major keys of being able to be vic victorious in a sport. I don't care if it's singular, golf, or whatever. You have to have the ability to talk yourself up to a different level. When you get to a certain level, you know, you can go through elementary, junior high, and little high school and all that. You know, you have differences. So you can have a, a little kid in sixth grade that's tall for his age, and the rest are a little short. And so that kid could have an advantage. But ultimately, when you get up to a certain level, there's a weeding process that goes on. And then all of a sudden, everybody's looking the same size. Everybody's getting bigger. Everybody's becoming stronger. And then the higher you go, the more normal it becomes. So, you know, at this size, you got this level and this height and everything else. And then you go to another, say so now you're going into a college, junior college, university, and all of a sudden it gets this way. And then you look at pro, you don't see, uh, okay, here we got the Cardinals, you know, their defensive tackle, 6'4", 300 pounds. And then here's the Dallas Cowboy, 5'9", 120 well, they play like that. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> the point is, is they're all going to be the same, right? What 
have, what's the difference at here, right here? And one of the things is their ability to what? Pump their selves up. No, no pro athlete goes into a game. Hope we can win. No, that's a junior hire. No pro athlete does that. I don't care where they're at. They're all saying, we got this. We got this. You ever seen boxing or, or you know, the UFC or anything like that? MMA? These guys are always talking like one of them's going to get beat up. But they're all talking like, no, I got this. Like, well, I'm going to win. I'm going to whoop him. I'm going to whoop him. I'm going to whip him and his family. <laughs> and then 30 seconds, boom, he's gone. <laughs> what? What happened? Well, what happened? That's what I'm trying to say. We got to build ourselves up. We got to build ourselves up. You know, um, when it comes to words, the Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So words carry weight. I can go over scripture after scripture after scripture, but I'm running out of time, so I don't want to, but I promise you. I promise you, the Bible will show you that your words carry power. It's either going to be good power or bad power, but it's going to carry power. Everybody in here understands that. In, in third grade, if someone said, you got a big nose, it hurts you. True or false? True. Well, why did it hurt you? Because you believed. Was it true? Most likely, probably not. Right? But, but you, you believed it. Huh. Reminds me of a picture in the very beginning of this whole thing. Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1. A picture of what? Satan comes in a serpent form. Eve's walking around the garden. Why she's in the middle of it, I don't know. Either way, she's getting around where she ought not to be. Adam's with her. So we can't say, is that dumb woman? We can't do that. We can't say, well, you know, it's, she thought there was a sale going on. Boom, she's right there. <laughs> we can't do anything like that. All we know is Adam's like going, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> so Eve's right now, and now she's, she's starting to talk with a serpent. We don't know, you know, people want to say, oh, is this snake or whatever? We don't know what it is. The Hebrew, it's just breaking down, it's what it, it's what it is. The point is, is he's talking to Eve. He says this, did God really say, did God really say something? Did God really say? She then says, God said what am I talking about? I'm talking about the power of words right now. He said, did God really say that you can eat of every fruit in the garden? Did God really say that? She says, well, God said we can eat every fruit except one right there. The one you're hanging around. Red flag, red flag. Did God really say you could eat all this? Now, please hear me. You that were an encounter last week and, and Saturday, listen to what I'm saying, because this is automatic what happens when you go to something where you're trying to help yourself be better. You're trying to get more information. You're trying to get your life on track. You're trying to get something that says, you know what? You're moving forward in this thing. Well, the enemy doesn't want you to do that, so he's going to come with, did God really say that? Is that really, is that really tongues? Sounds like gibberish to me. Did God, did, did God really, did, did God, did God, did God? He's still doing that right now. He says to Eve, did God really say that? And she said, no, he said, we can't, we can't, that one, we can have everything else. But if we do that one, we can't eat, we can't touch it. And if we do, we're going to die. And the devil goes, you're not going to. And this is what is the Hebrew language. God said, eat it. You will die, die. Spiritual death will then equal physical death. Before 
they would never die. Never. Because they were spiritually alive. But God said, eat it and you'll die, die. It says surely die. It's not surely. It's the same word, die, die. Two deaths, spiritual death, physical death. Then Eve goes, you'll die. So she didn't even add the two dies. She says, you'll die. The devil comes and says, you're not going to die, die. Which is, it's crazy what's going on. Now process, what's going on? He's talking to Eve. What's Eve hearing? Is, is, he, is she hearing words or not? Is she hearing words? Did she hear words from God? She heard words that said, the Bible says, or God says, or Adam said, we can't do this. This is what happens. Or she heard it from God and added something to it. Can't touch this. And that's what she did. She said, you can't eat it or you can't touch it. Dun, 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 dun. All right? Are you guys following me? Said, God said. Did God really say, 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 words, 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 words. Hear me. The devil is lying. Words. Eve is listening to what? Words, which are not true. He's trying to rob God's word with his word. The lie now has power. Why? Because she believed it. But it's a lie. And the only way you can empower a lie is if you believe the lie. Otherwise, it has no power. No power. It's a picture that we need to pay attention to. The devil lied. She believed and she died, ultimately dying. Adam died, ultimately dying. And from that point, sin nature entered into us all because of believing a lie and power came upon that word. How many of you are believing a lie? And it's powerful. Not because it really has power, but because you believe it, which gave it power. You empowered the lie. Ain't got nothing on you. It's weak. It's not strong. It's nothing. It's a Mickey Mouse face on a $100 bill. You laugh at that. But what happened is now is you believe it. And that belief gave it power and is robbing you. It's robbing you of all the great and good things that God has for your life. Only because you've empowered a lie. What, what do we, how do we fix this? We've got to get the sound word back in our lives. The sound. Is this going to bring health, wholeness to me? Is this going to build me up? Is this going to strengthen me? Not only do we have to be speaking to ourselves, which we got to be doing more good things, not negative. Y'all speak to yourselves. Most of the time, it's bad. It's time to flip that. You know what you're thinking? But I'm only speaking what's true. No, you're not. You're speaking a lie. Your truth is based upon past. True, I mean, your, your truth is based upon past lie. God's word is truth now, today. It's yesterday in here. An hour ago is in here. I'm here right now. So I make a decision. Don't fan that flame. Yeah, I might have screwed up an hour ago, but right now, I, I'm on it. I'm on it. I, I'm going to move away from that. I'm going to change this thing. I'm going to change this thing because this is God's plan for my life, to do good to good things. I got to stir this gift up, move it around, move it around. And this is exactly what the, if you look at John chapter one, the first thing that John says, he says, and the word became flesh. The word, God, the word was with God. The word was God. I mean, establishing the word of God is this power. And, and when it says the word of God became flesh, the word is logos or lego is the root word. And it's a spoke, it's a spoken information to bring revelation. Spoken, spoken, spoken. It's spoken information. It's giving you picture. It's giving you understanding. And that's what it's saying, that that's who Jesus is. And then he comes on the scene and says, listen, you know why I'm here? I'm here to speak. Yeah, it's defined to preach. It's defined 
gospel. It's defined that way, but all it's saying is, I'm here to tell people. I'm here to speak. I'm here to speak to the brokenhearted. I'm here to speak those that are bound up. I'm here to speak to set the captives free. I'm here to speak, speak, speak. Why? There's power in those words. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. If you believe. Only if you believe. You can read this all day long. You can hear this all day long. But until you believe, there's no power in it. There's no power. The word is a seed and it's got to be planted. I believe. And when it's planted, I now have responsibility to protect it, to hold tight, to grip hold of that thing. Nothing's going to mess with it. Why? Because I believe in it. Well, what if? It doesn't matter what if. I'm not going with what ifs. It's what God's word says. Tenacious people. Time to get aggressive with this thing. Quit being wimpy Christians. It's time to be people that are living life big, experiencing big, doing big. Because my big God, my big daddy, my big papa in heaven that sent Jesus to show his love for me, he says, I've got a plan for you. I've got a vision for you. And my heart is to see good things happen in and through you. Listen, you all are awesome. And it's time to live that awesomeness. No more empowering lies. Let's start getting this truth. Amen. Let's start living the truth. And by living the truth, you'll start applying the truth. Then and only then will you be set free. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the truth of that word. And we believe with all our hearts that this word is life. And that life has entered into my heart. And I received this life this morning. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus, I'd like to give you an opportunity. If you're out there uh, on the, on the uh, internet and you have never received Jesus, I'd like to give you the opportunity. The way we do this is what the Bible says. Call in the name of Jesus and he's going to save you. So what we do is we're going to call in the name of Jesus and we're going to get saved. Saved means deliver, set free, made whole. We will have eternal life with the family of God. And that's what we do. We're going to believe and we're going to experience that. So everybody in here, you can say this after me, but if you've never done this, do it today, right now. This is your opportunity. Out there, listen to me. Repeat the words and receive a new life. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, because I do, with my heart, open up to you and say, please come in. I believe in you, Jesus, and because of that, I receive you into my life, and I will live for you from this time forward. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life setting me free. I am a part of your family now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer the first time, can you lift your hand? I have something for you. If you prayed that prayer, I got some information that'll help you. And if you prayed that prayer out there, write us. I'll give you this booklet. I'll help you in your life, your new walk, but that's your choice. And like I always say, you're not going to be bombarded with any kind of letter after I send you this one. In other words, you don't go on a mailing list and we're going to start begging for money. We don't beg for money. So write, we'll send it to you and it'll be yours. And we expect great things. And if you need it, lift your hands and we'll get you one. Amen. All right, y'all. Love you guys. You're awesome.